This is the Tandy TRS-80 Model 100 computer, affectionately known as the Model T of laptops. And this is my demake of Baldur's Gate 3. This project brings a charmingly simplified adaptation of BG3's first act to one of the world's first laptops. Specifically, it has an explorable overworld with multiple locations recreated in ASCII art, multiple playable origin characters, a rough approximation of the plot, and 5th edition based combat on a JRPG inspired battle screen. The core of this project is a standalone repository called the Dungeon Delver Engine, or DDE for short. It has everything from core tabletop mechanics to all aspects of the main gameplay loop, including exploration, combat, and menus. It's included as a sub-module of a repo called Mall, which is where things like story text, environment data, and any other non-SRD content lives. What exactly do I mean by non-SRD? This is the Open Gaming License System Reference Document version 5.1. You can sort of think of it like the limited-use open-ish core of D&D 5th edition. It outlines rules of combat and defines core classes, spells, monsters, and more. The main thing it enables is the ability for third parties to sell 5e-compatible content that doesn't use established IP like Forgotten Realms or other stuff close to the D&D brand. Obviously, a Baldur's Gate game wouldn't be covered under that license. Keeping the repository separate should allow me to reuse the majority of this work if this gets taken down. DDE on its own, used with the novel campaign, should be, as far as I'm aware, a totally valid use of the SRD. That said, this project is on a very niche platform and very small in scope. I really see it more like interactive fan art than a proper demake. So let's take a look at it. And by the way, while it is heavily truncated, this section does contain basic plot details for the first act of the real game, so if you want to skip to the more tech-oriented part of the video, it's here. When you first start it up, you're given the option to either create a custom character or choose from one of the four supported origin characters. You're then given some story text with a highly abridged and edited version of the game's opening cutscene, and dropped into the bridge of the Nautiloid airship that kidnapped you. Here, the Mind Flayer Captain, assuming you're under his thrall, commands you to get to the ship's transponder, optionally fighting Commander Jalk along the way. The ship then crashes and you meet Shatterheart, unless you're playing as her, in which case you still get a small scene showing the artifact. Either way, Shadowheart is forced into the party, and on the same screen, you can optionally recruit Gale. From here, the objective is to progress toward Baldur's Gate, which requires passing two points. The first is the single passage to the Underdark, which you can open by either killing or interacting with a certain character. The second is at the end of the Underdark in the Grimforge, where you're forced to encounter True Soul Mir, who acts as the final boss. Going straight there, though, would spell almost certain doom. Near the Blighted Village, you can choose to recruit Karlak and or Lazel. To build up experience, there are essentially two quest lines. If you fight your way through the goblins at the gate to the Emerald Grove and talk to Zevlor and Kaga, you'll learn the goblins came from a cult to the west, and defeating their three leaders will earn the grove's residence thanks. Along this path, killing Priestess Gut will open up the ladder to the Underdark, but you may wish to finish off the other leaders for additional experience. Alternatively, you can go right to the Goblin Camp and allow Priestess Gut to brand you with the Mark of the Absolute. This will open up the way as well, but to gather more experience, you can help the Goblins finish off the Grove. Help draw Ragslin with his interrogation of a Mind Flayer, and talk to Minthara after Gut and Drawer, and she'll trust you enough to join the attack. At which point, the party can head to the Grove and kill Zevlor and Kaga. Once either path is done, the party will have leveled up enough to head down and defeat Nier, ending the first act of the story. For now, this is also the end of the demake. This cuts the game's story down to the absolute bare minimum, and even a handful of initially implemented things like Us the Intellect Devourer and a more expansive overworld had to be cut to deal with the main limitation on this platform, memory. 
Before I dig more into how the game works, let's talk a bit about the Model 100 itself. The Model 100 sports an Intel 80C85 CPU running at 2.4 MHz, a built-in 40-column 8-line display, a QWERTY keyboard with function keys, multiple I.O. ports, and built-in Microsoft BASIC. This model also has 24 kilobytes of RAM, a tier that cost almost $1,400 in 1983, or about the price of a fully kitted out 16-inch MacBook Pro in today's money. It's powered by four AA batteries and has an onboard rechargeable battery to keep memory saved for up to 30 days while powered off. There were tape and disk drives available, but I don't have them. For development, I'm using an emulator called Virtual T, and it doesn't have support for them either. So my current development setup is limited to what I can load over the serial cable. You can download plain text files and basic scripts fairly easily using the built-in terminal applications download feature. However, this project is a native executable, or machine language program in Tandy parlance, and the commands to load up machine language programs can't do so through the serial port. So I built a small basic program that can read in an Intel hex format file over the serial port. It's pretty slow, taking about 50 milliseconds to process each character, so once the project got big enough, I wrote an assembly version that runs much faster. So exactly how much memory does that leave us with? On the 24K machine, the top of installed RAM is at address B000, but I can't necessarily take up everything after that since both the system itself and my program will need some amount of stack space at the end of memory. Luckily, there's a little bit of a hint in BASIC itself. It has its own dynamic memory limit set in the high mem variable, which I already have to set back to address B000 to prevent it from overwriting my game once I load it up. On a cold boot, it's set to 62960, or hex F5F0. That gives me a contiguous block of memory 17,904 bytes long, but I reserved the first 512 for the fast loader program, giving me about 17.3 kilobytes for the game itself. Now, I wouldn't have had to figure all that out or write custom loader apps if I had just stuck with BASIC, which is how this project started. This version is reasonably well featured with an RNG floating point math and string formatting, but variable names are limited to two characters. You can end it with a type code and use the name as long as you want, but internally the system only tracks the first two characters. While that does leave a decent overall number of variables available, avoiding name clashes got tedious almost instantly as you really need to abandon all hope of meaningful names. At that point, assembly sounded genuinely easier. Luckily, I found this fantastic assembler called Zasm, Z-A-S-M? I'm not sure. It's primarily a Z80 assembler, but Z80 is a binary superset of 8080, and Zilog uses generally more readable mnemonics than 8080. To compile an 8080 project, there's an easy flag that will fail the build if any non-8080 instructions are used. That wasn't often an issue. The main thing I miss from the Zilog architecture is bit manipulation, and even then the only real impact is that a few pieces of code are a little bit longer than I'd like. I really mean it when I say Zazen is fantastic, too. In addition to the things you would expect, like macros, labels, and other preprocessor stuff, it even has a built-in emulator for running unit tests. I don't have a lot, but it's been an invaluable tool for debugging. It also allows you to define character mappings that automatically replace chosen Unicode characters with a single byte value, so even though the literal encoding isn't the same, I'm able to use Unicode characters in source code that look close enough to the graphical characters in the Tandy. They do tend to render a little wide in VS Code, though, so some imagination is still required in development. I won't get too deep into the code, but I will go over the broader architecture. The engine has some core library subroutines, and all of the UI elements for exploration, combat, menus, and character creation. It also has the screen controller, which is sort of like the main loop that handles switching between those modes based on exit flags. The MAL repo sets up those components with data and text specific to the BG3 campaign. It also registers the Cambian monster type and Githyanki race with reserved spaces in DDE since the engine needs to know about them for the story, but they're not covered in the SRD. Menus are pretty basic. They list a small number of options you can navigate with the arrow keys, and there's a flag to disable specific options. Character creation is just a couple of menus between an ability role screen and the sole use of the text entry screen. The battle UI is basically classic Final Fantasy with D&D rules. The main concession it makes is simplifying movement to front and back lines like a JRPG. It doesn't affect ranged attacks, but melee attacks can't be made from more than one line apart, and attackers right next to each other have advantage on hit. 
It's also pretty light on spells and abilities, having only Firebolt and Sacred Flame. There's also an Inspect option to check up on everyone. Battle is also the only place you can die. Hit points aren't tracked anywhere else and are filled at the start of each encounter. The exploration screen is the most complex. Background graphic data is given as a series of eight 20 character strings. To keep things simple, the player is only allowed to walk on empty spaces in that map. You also have to set a title and then provide up to 10 interactables. Each interactable has a location, an enable-disable flag, and can set to be triggered either by pressing a button near them or by stepping right on them. Another two requirements are addresses to two callback subroutines. One provides prompt text for interactions, and one executes the interaction itself. The interaction callback is where Maul handles its event scripting. Doors are interactables that you step on, and the interaction callback flags the exploration screen to exit and gives the screen controller the ID of the screen or battle encounter to run next. Dialogue and other events can be triggered by standing one cardinal space away and pressing enter when the prompt is shown. The right half of the exploration screen is left blank so that simple scripted events can use that space as a basic interruption to the exploration UI loop. It only got used once, but there's also a skill check UI that works here too. Full screen dialogue isn't a part of the engine and is hacked into Maul as an exploration screen that just never calls the exploration UI. The pause menu is also implemented in Maul. It's opened up via a callback given to the exploration UI, but the menu itself is campaign defined. What I ended up with is pretty generic though, so I could see porting it to the engine as an optional built in later. And that's basically it when it comes to user facing features, but there's one last interesting thing to talk about. This project has over 5 kilobytes of text, which would push us way over our limit, so I put together a simple dictionary coder compression system. The text is fed into a Python script via a JSON file that supports both single strings and lists of strings. Since this isn't a lot of text for a modern system and the longest string is only 40 characters, it works by just brute forcing its way through every possible substring, calculating how many bytes it would save by extracting it to a common table, and doing so for the most effective substring. It repeats that from scratch up to 127 times, and stops when it hits a point where it would add bytes to extract anything that's left. It then generates an assembly file that stores each string as a normal character sequence, but anything over 127 is treated as a reference into that table by the print compressed string subroutine. This does mean that I'm cut off from using most of the system's graphical characters, but plain text does account for the overwhelming majority of strings in the project. In all, this saves us about 1500 bytes. The top three removed sequences are 15 spaces, space the, and space u, which have 6, 53, and 38 uses respectively. I mainly chose this approach for its simplicity on the assembly side. Each string can be directly referenced with its label, just like I did before compression, and the print compressed string subroutine was pretty simple to write. In a later attempt to conserve space, I did circle back around and try out Huffman coding. There's a more detailed explanation of this in the form of a closed pull request on the DDE repo, but suffice to say that after the initial investigation, it just didn't seem worth it. And that's it. I owe a huge thanks to the various Tandy community members who've written their own documentation for this thing over the decades. Seriously, the manual wasn't quite enough to figure all this out. I also owe my dad a huge thanks for sending this thing over, found it in some of his old stuff and thought I'd find it interesting. And thank you a lot for watching if you made it this far. If you like this sort of thing, especially text-based retro game development, then you want to stick around because I think you're really going to like the next project too. Until then though, see ya!